Me, I can, if somebody says they caught fish on a pink beaded waltz and I didn't have any, I could take their pink beaded waltz and go throw it and have confidence that I'm going to catch a fish on it. I go to the river I'm guiding on and it's, it's, it's runoff and I'm like, how in the world do you fish this? I yeah. mean, it's like rolling, like class five rapid, the whole thing. Like, there's not even a place for a fish to hold. I was like, um, I wish I could have got the chance to fish those lakes in the tournament. I could have done pretty well. But that was the team's choice, not mine. I mean, you don't give a guy an egg, and I don't know if he knows even what to do. You know what I'm saying? I feel like nothing's stable. I'm not looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> so, who's the top five anglers in the United States right now? Right now? Uh, do you say throwing back 50 centimeter fish? Calling 50 centimeter fish. I think they called like 55 years ago. Yeah. I don't remember many 60s being <laughs> caught here lately, do you? Finished top five in two consecutive cycles. We got picked for one of them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And now this is like, you're out. Like, I want you out, right? I think the team knows this one world. We're missing out big time. Sleep Fly Fish Show. All right, welcome to the Eat Sleep Fly Fish podcast. I'm Roger Wilson. I'm Sean Isaacs. I'm Michael Bradley. We're here with uh, Michael Bradley, current Team USA World Team, four time regional champion. Back to back individual bronze medalist at nationals and sixth at the America's Cup. When was that? When was the Ameri last America's Oof, Cup? 2014, 2015. It was a while back, it's huh? Been a, it's been a while. So, um, I might be off on that too. It's been a long time. But yeah, we were just talking about maybe the America's Cup's coming back. Yeah, there was talk about it. I don't I seen where John Knight posted about. Something that's along the lines of stay in tuned for upcoming events on the America Cup Facebook page. That'd be sweet. So hopefully it shows back up. So if that was to happen, would like Team USA put a team together or Team USA would have three teams in it. I think. I'm pretty sure. Is that they the way they did the it in the past? One. Yeah. They had three teams. And then I guess there's also People come from abroad too, right? Yeah, yeah. It's an international level event. Did the Spaniards and the Czechs show up? I can't remember which team that was. There's the see, Canadian team was there. Merrick Walsh. I can't remember which team he competes for. I believe Czech. Maybe. I don't know. He was there. But the youth, the youth team won it one year, right? The youth team won it one year and then got second or third the next year. And it's always been in Colorado? From what I can remember. I've only been to one, and that was the last one they did. What do you, what, what do you think was the magic behind that youth team from years back when they won all the golds and won the, the team cup? I mean, was it just a handful of really good anglers, or was there – a combination of their skill level and their um, their um, ability to share and take each other's info and put it to work. Yeah, because I know Paul coached them, and Paul, every time I've ever worked with Paul, he's like big on team mentality, team mentality. Yeah, he, he called it team metal mentality. And, yeah. And I guess it's kind of hard, Lawson, you – like, I hear everything you're doing. <laughs> like, it's, like, echoing. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, 
Yeah, so we're tying flies in here. We're we're here at the big uh, the fourth Cherokee Championship. So anyway, while we're, I'm changing subject here, also but, uh, Cherokee Championship. This is the last one. Cherokee Series, the championship is the actual last one, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is the fourth main event. So this is the event that you. This is the last chance to get in the top twenty-four if you're not already in it. Yeah. Or if you are already in it, to stay in it, I guess. Right? Yeah. And into. I'm sure there'll be some shuffling around a little bit this weekend. Yeah, so. I, I don't have the list in front of me. I guess there's there's a few uh, scrapping like. Probably like fifteen through maybe thirty. Those guys are really battling maybe to get in there. Yeah, they're pretty tight down there, and even even the guys up top, you know, they're they all got put in the same group, so they're going to be <laughs> duking it out for first place. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough group. Uh, yeah, you read that group, and I was almost thinking like. Man, did he do this on purpose? This is crazy. Like, well, I did the test draw, and it was the same group, and I, and I deleted it because I knew somebody was probably going to cancel, and sure enough, somebody canceled. Put the ghost in, and all I did was put the ghost in group A, and all the other ones changed. I was like, God. Yeah. So what led you to, to have this? I mean, what spurred the idea, and what, what kind of got uh, it going? It, it actually came from one of the – Guys at uh, um, Destination Marketing in Cherokee, he pitched the idea um, to have some sort of series. They wanted more, but that's the best I could do for the time frame that they gave me. So we got it started in October. They wanted a November one, but we were we were leaving mid November for a world championship. So the best I could do was get started in December. And I said, I, I told them if they can give me money for the winners, I can put it on for them. So that's what they've done. So do you think this will be something we do every year? Or? We're already talking about next year's. We're going to try and get different prizes. Uh, I'm sure more – it seems like most people like cash prizes over – over rides. I mean, if you win, you've you've already got the tools to do that, so you don't need a spare one. Right. Yeah, and people are partial to their brands, right? So like, yeah. if it's not their brand, then they try to sell it. So you might as well yeah. give cash anyway. I guess. Yeah. They probably wouldn't be thousand dollar cash prizes for first place, but I would say five hundred for first for the next year's. Yeah, that keeps it. I mean, I, I'm glad you have that because it keeps you showing up no matter yeah. where you are on the leaderboard, right? I mean, yeah. you're not just trying to get the five grand or whatever at the end. Yeah. You got something to get every yeah. tournament. And I'm really thankful for the sponsors that we do have for the events and, and all the people that have helped out. So, yeah, it's been a really fun event for sure. And uh, we got to change the name, though. It's got to be like the <laughs> high water. Ch- Cherokee series because yeah. every single tournament we were talking about this last night. Every tournament, it's like actually it's like really high, two thousand or higher, and then right before the tournament, it gets down to right where thousand. you can handle it. I guess. Yep. You're probably getting tired of those texts. Are we going to fish? Or oh man, I tell you what, <laughs> it's it was nonstop for January. I must have got twenty messages from people, and February kind of. Stand out a little bit, and only a couple for this one. There was a kid, I can't remember his name. He was here from uh, Colorado at the Max. last tournament. Yeah, Max. Yeah. Max Logan. I yep, told him Max he had like Logan. a superhero name. <laughs> he looked at me kind of weird, but I was like, you got a superhero name. But anyway, uh, he uh, he told me where he was from and everything, and I was like, well, he's like, so what's what's it like fishing here? And I said, well, it's not fishing anything like it normally does. I said oh, it'll be more sure. like your it'll be more like you're used to probably out west now with all the high water. Because me and Sean went to uh, Montana when did we go last summer this September. September. Man, like the Madison was rolling like yeah. I, uh, the water volume like it was scary wading out there, and you had a hard time getting flies down and. It was a different deal. Yeah, I've seen it like that a time or two. Not not often. We went to Gunnison 
three or four years ago, and it was pretty high water on some of the streams that we fished. But still catch them. They're there. So you were born and raised here in Cherokee, North Carolina. Correct. Well, I was born in Silva. Our, our hospital stopped taking babies about 1980, I believe. Close enough, so, right? So. Yeah. Born in Silva, grew up in Cherokee. So with your <clears throat> all your accomplishments in the fly fishing world, I mean, you could guide anywhere. I mean, you could go Montana, Alaska, wherever, but you, you like it right here in Cherokee. Yeah. Uh, I've had offers to go out west and guide in Wyoming and Colorado, but they talked about – Guiding 100 days straight, and I prefer not to do that if I can help it. I like to guide a couple of days and fish five days. <laughs> Fun fish. You like living a, the dream right there. Yeah, you like a more <laughs> relaxed guide schedule, right? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I remember uh, I fished with you three or four years ago, and we were catching like – Big monster fish and elk are in the boat. Remember that giant bull oh, yeah. elk that was yeah. like walking through the downtown there? Yeah. And I was like, "You got it all right here." I mean, why would you yeah. need to go out west? Yeah, I mean, it's we got sweet. we got a pretty pretty diverse fishery in the area. We can bass fish all year. We can trout fish all year. So we got the best of both worlds, really. All right. So, one thing I want to talk to you about, <clears throat> you I mean, this is, how many years competing for you now? I honestly don't know. I believe seven, maybe, probably seven and a half. I believe October 2013 was my first competition. So, was that like a trout legend? It was a trout legend. Comp back yeah, then? it was trout legend on the upper Nanahela, and there was half the youth team that was on the world championship team for them at the time was there and I got a little lucky and won it <laughs> a little lucky a little yes, lucky yeah I didn't I, I had no clue what I'd done <clears throat> just went out and you just went fishing right I went fishing with a green mop a big egg and a waltz worm that's all I had <laughs> Some people are just and, fishy like and that. then after it's over he's like what you're not supposed to catch 40 <laughs> fish a session Oh. I think it was 32 and 21. <laughs> yeah, some of my exact numbers. Yeah. So, it seems to me, I mean, I don't know if this is true. You can tell me your thoughts on it. But it seems like there's been almost like two lives to the to the competition scene around this area. I mean, it was like mm-hmm. there's almost like two generations, I guess yeah, you'd say, sure. sort of. Uh, there was kind of like the trout legend and a lot of the guys that fished those tournaments back then. And... A lot of those, I don't know that there's a lot of carryover until the, the comp scene now. I mean, it's like a lot of those guys are doing different things nowadays. Um, I mean, you see them around. Here yeah, there. there there wasn't much carryover coming from Trout Legend to the the newer leagues. Uh, ben Van Devender and it's just a handful of the guys on Dead Drift have been there through Trout Legend and. Not many from North Carolina came through. Joey still competes time to time. I'm sure Hunter and Hunter and his dad Scott Inlow would compete more if they were still in North Carolina. They moved out to Gunnison. And why do you think those guys don't compete as much anymore? Uh, I don't know. Just found different things in life. I know a lot of. I don't know that it's even that they got burned out. I just think they found other hobbies and stuff they like to do. I know a lot of them, a lot of them love to hunt, so they spend a lot of time getting ready for that. And the bass fishing seems to be getting popular too. Yeah, bass fishing's gotten super popular. I've gotten into that pretty heavy the last four years. You do well in that also. I've, yeah, won more money in that last year than trout fishing. (laughs) Spent more money too, though. (laughs) Yeah, it almost reminds me of like <clears throat> bluegrass artists that uh, they only you know, start out playing bluegrass and then they realize there's no money in bluegrass. We're going to country music, right? That's where the money's at. Our passion 
It is bluegrass, but the money's in country. It's kind of like fly fishing. My passion's fly fishing, but there ain't no money in it. <laughs> Only money in fly fishing spending. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what do you think about, do you think the anglers as a whole um, have gotten better over that time span? Or mm. how, how does how does the trout legend, the guys that competed back then, and the guys that kind of compete now, do you see any disconnect or skill level changes? Or I mean, you know, you got the the internet's running rampant now. I mean, you've got all this information, and the Euro Nymphin is coming more, you know, more out in the scenes, and yeah. people are knowing more about it. So, what have you seen, like, from that time, from when you started to kind of now, as far as progression, English skills, and that type of thing? Uh, I'm gonna say. When I first started, the versatility wasn't as there as much as it is now. But there were really good anglers back then. There were there were more people fishing, I guess, different angles in which they approached the water with their leaders and stuff. Uh, and there was more casting going on back then, too. So right now there's a lot of just regular lobbing I mean it's it's pretty straightforward either way but it seemed to be a lot more casting going on back in the trout legend days and the anglers that were in there they'd Pat Wise fishing a lot uh, a lot of, a lot of the guys in Pennsylvania New York area they were a lot more active in the trout legend days they still do some tournaments but I would say back then it was was the league to begin so i know like uh i i can't say his name and I, i'm afraid i just butcher it trying but vladi the, the czech guy right that yeah. won the world championship i guess he came to the usa and he taught some of our anglers some I, of the skills and i honestly don't know I, that was before my time yeah the USA. well i was just thinking you know uh like a lot of those guys used to put on the heavy, heavy flies, and you basically just dredge the bottom, dragging your flies, you know. And then, this, and then different techniques evolve, yeah. longer leaders, lighter flies, and that sort of thing. And I just kind of wondered, did you see any of that from, like, when you first started to kind of now? Yeah. Or is that what you're kind of talking about with the versatility? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I first got in, we were using the, the – our leader butts were 20 pounds. Or 15, depending on what you wanted to do. But just a steady taper. And they were pretty f- versatile leaders, we thought. I mean, we could dry drop, throw single dry, throw double light nymphs, whatever. Uh, float the cider. It's to where now, a lot of people have gone to light, super lightweight leaders. Like, I throw a 3X leader all the time, 3X fluorocarbon. And that's that's extremely light. And I couldn't throw a single dry. It struggles with a lightweight dry dropper. But I have other rigs for that that I'll have rigged up on the side of the water for competition use. I was going to say, I, I think I must be behind the times because I have a 20-pound butt section in my leader. And I use it for that reason because mm-hmm. I can do anything with it. Yeah. You know, I don't have to change yeah. anything. Yeah. So do you think the more specialized leaders are better? Than just having a versatile leader? Or? Well, it depends. On the water if type. I, and in the world championship, I, I had four rods rigged up on both on both of them that I went to. Um, I had single dry, dry dropper, two double net frigs. And that might have been it. I, I carried a streamer rod in my box just in or in my case just in case something came up and I needed to throw streamers. But for the most part, we fish our streamers on our nymph rigs on 7X too. So. so speaking of the world championship, um, did you, I mean, you did you, how did you guys get ready for that? I mean, when you got over there, did you have like, was a week long you practice? You get there a week early and start practicing? We had five days. Five days. In my opinion, we needed ten. <clears throat> a lot of the other teams had ten days of practice. 
and the teams that won, 10 to 12 days of practice. So we're missing out big time. A lot of the water we got to was already pounded. And the lakes that we fished have already been beat up. Talking about practice water, right? Yeah, yeah. A lot of practice water. And we couldn't practice on the actual venues. We weren't able to get out on the lakes and ride around and look at stuff. And um, I really wish I could have got the chance to fish those lakes in the tournament. I feel like I could have done pretty well. But that was the team's choice, not mine. So when you get there, uh, you got you, you guys have a guide that kind of yeah. shows you the water. Yeah. And uh, was he helpful? I guess somewhat. Somewhat. For for me, no. For some of the other guys, he he put them on a couple lake flies that help. Josh Graffin, for instance, he he fished his flies and he finished six. So. One of the things that I've I've been really curious about, and I think it could help a lot of competitive teams out there, is how you practice, how the team practices to get ready for an event. Like, you go to the water, your first time seeing the water, I mean, you have a general idea of what, you know, you get knowledge of, like, stockfish, wild fish, you know, obviously know the time of the year, what bugs are probably eating. But, but what's the progression – of how you go about figuring out the system of how it works. I mean, uh, it's a long process. So we start. We were already asking questions about Finland, so they they get in touch with our guides way ahead of time, and get info from them and sends us fly patterns, uh, tippet sizes, fish locations. Uh, yeah, mainly stuff like that. Uh, that that's, all that starts sometimes a year in advance, depending on who we've got. We've got the same guide for Finland that we had in Italy. So he he goes back and forth. He's he's got he's got business on in both countries there. So do you guys just pair up like two people and then at when the we end get of there? The day, yeah, after your practice, do you just so so a typical practice day for us? We go out. Um, if we all go to the same venue. So, in Italy, we all went to the same practice water. Usually, we paired up in groups of two, and everybody split up, and uh, just run through cycles, your your personal cycles of flies, just whatever your go-to patterns are. And, and you, meet, you meet back at HQ and kind of talk about what yeah. you found out, right? Yeah, we meet back at lunch, usually, or dinner, whatever we're going to, and sit down and talk about it, set all our flies out. We have a, a big fly box with each of our names on a row, and we'll post our best flies and second best flies and stuff that might have caught a fish or had some looks. Put, put them all in there. All right. Let me make sure I got this right. So you have a, your fly box. Team fly box. A team fly box. Team fly box. And then a row is for Michael Bradley, mm-hmm. right? And then you're putting your the flies that you did real well with it. Yeah. And then that way you just pass that around and be like. Yeah, I mean, if, if people have questions about it, they say, oh, what were you catching them on? You're like, oh, they're in here. They can get it out and look at it and copy it, whatever they need to do. Or do nothing. Or, or just keep doing your A lot of times do nothing. I, I <laughs> feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of times they just stick with their own stuff, which, I mean, a confidence thing is is hard to beat. Yeah. I, me, I can, if somebody says they caught fish on a pink beaded waltz and I didn't have any, I could take their pink beaded waltz and go throw it and have confidence that I'm going to catch a fish on it. Other people, and most of the people on our team aren't like that, and that's that's just the way they are. They're still good anglers, but... I would prefer them to have a little more confidence in what I show them. So when you, so I guess after you go through the fly selection, all that, and you're, it's just a big discussion on. Yeah. Yeah, I basically did this. Like I fished higher, the fish were up, the fish were down. Yeah. Th- that type of stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's just all, all your a typical team discussion. I mean, each each angler 
we go around the room and talk about what we learned. So what did you, um, <clears throat> so what did you, just give us your idea on fishing, was it New, no, it was Tasmania, right? Tasmania. So what was the big, what was the big thing on Tasmania? Like if you was to go back, like when I fish these Cherokee comps, you know, after I'm over, after I'm done with one, I'm like, okay, I know, I know what to do with the next one, right? Yeah. So what would you do? What did, what did you find out? What was the what was the gig over there in Tasmania? Mm. I guess on the rivers because that's what you you didn't did you fish any lake sessions? I didn't fish any lake sessions. I did fish some lakes afterwards, um, but for the rivers, I would be more prepared with a bigger selection of dry flies. They really liked them. Was the water low and clear, or one of the streams was low? I guess it was low. I don't. I'm not sure what the actual level of it was, but it was clear. And the other one was it seemed low for the river. It was it was a tailwater, and it seemed like it was about eight inches low. As you could see a water line there, mm-hmm. and it was chalk chalky looking, but. You could still spot fish that were on bottom and whatnot. But those those fish really, really like dry flies. Like you could cover about any of them and they'd come up and eat it. Wow. But in the sessions, it was so windy that it was hard to even see the fish. I sight fished one of them. And he, he ate the dry no problem. Speaking of wind, I saw some of those videos of those guys on the lakes. Yeah. And that wind was crazy. It yeah. Like it was whipping. It was on the river too, just like that. Didn't even have to cast a dry. Didn't even have to cast with a with the dry fly line. Just pick your rod tip up and it carried across the river. <laughs> so, in all your world travels and going to all these different countries and places, even within the country, mm-hmm. our country, is there? <clears throat> well, I guess you couldn't say in our country, but when you've gone to different worlds and you've gone to Tasmania. And Italy. And Italy. Mm-hmm. Is there, and I've heard you talk about the different places and how the worlds are kind of set up. Is Can you mimic that? Can you practice that anywhere in the United States? Or is it just like you can only deal with it when you get there? It's really hard to prepare for, I guess, if you're trying to match a water type. It's really, really hard to prepare for that because you don't know. They'll send you pictures and videos of the best looking pieces of water but that's only like it'll be like one beat or two beats Tasmania was they, they sent us pictures and stuff of better looking water and some of the beats were just flat as this table right here and my beat was one of those but all, all five of my fish come out of that water and the guy before me only caught four out so kind of like frog water type just real yeah. Calm, slow, still yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really hard to prepare for stuff like that. Especially here, we don't have a lot of that. Yeah. The Tuck of CG does, but it's not. It's packed so full of stock trout, it's hard to hard to mimic steel. Yeah. Do you have a favorite water type you like to fish? I really like riffles. A nice long run that has some speed to it. I know, like certain people prefer pocket water or the big yeah. deep runs, or yeah. like you said, riffles. I feel like I can make a riffle last a lot longer than pocket water. See, I kind of grew up on the South Holston, and I like to fish a lot of let low, slow stuff, calm yeah. water, like dry dropper type stuff, long distance casting. Oh, that's that's kind of what we had in Tasmania too was, <clears throat> was throwing 50, 60, 70 foot dry droppers. And that was more productive on the Mercy River. All right. So talking about the Cherokee series again, <clears throat> give us uh, the first hand – because you know it better than anybody. Give me the characteristics of the general water and the trophy water. Uh, the trophy water is a lot of big, nice runs and pulls. There's a little bit of pocket water. 
Um, but for the most part, it's just big, like your, I don't know what you would want to call them, like your real guidey looking holes, like something you can post up in and spend two or three hours and catch two or three fish. One's you're going to see several people fishing in, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm thinking of like big hole, rumble hole. Right, all them yeah, name holes, confluence holes, school bridge, rumble hole, What's the other? rock garden, guide hole, the guide hole. So, do you think there's a big difference in the fish for the difference? For some reason, there is in the trophy section. There aren't as many wild fish as there are in the general water, and I don't. I honestly don't know why. But I, I mean, you can you can fish a trophy section all day and catch half a dozen wild fish, depending on where you go. Um, in the general water, you go up there anywhere you pull up, you're going to catch half a dozen. Go to the next spot, catch half a dozen, and they're just everywhere. Not necessarily for the the tournaments we're doing. It's been <laughs> a little different, but well, there's not a Michael Bradley fishing this tournament, so. <laughs> I've always thought the trophy section was kind of like, um, like a like the retreat center or kind of like a, a a tamed down version of the Soqui. I mean, I always thought it like big, like it seems like used to the average was like forty centimeters on the trophy water, you know. Yeah. And, but there weren't as many, but the ones that were there were big, and then the general water was more like. You know, your wild fish and your cookie cutter stalkers, the 10, 12 inch ones. But yeah. I, I think that's changed some. I think it seems to be changing. It's I probably think, the way they're stocking it, I guess. I think the general water is putting up bigger stalkers than it used to. The, I mean, you get a lot of those in the mid to upper 30 centimeters now, which is what, 12, 13, 14 inches? And the occasional 18 inch stalker out of the general water. Um, the trophy section still has a lot of big fish in it. They're just, they're, uh, they're super smart. I had the, I had to rumble hole my last session and I, I was catching, you know, stock fish like this, like mm-hmm. two or three of them. And then I caught like a 48 centimeter. Yep. And I was like, well, that's what I'm used to. Yeah. And that's what I typically think of the trophy section. Yeah. Fish like that, you know. But yeah. it seems like there's more of the... Yeah, there's there's a lot of those 12 to 14-inch stalkers in there right now. I believe a lot of those actually washed down in the high waters that we've had. Uh, if you can weed through those, there's there's some 23s and 4s in there to be caught. Oh, yeah. And you can see them at the school bridge, too. Okay. So we saw one in there today. It was probably 23 First term, it was probably the Rumble, I think, 2013. No, been a while. And uh, I think the Hunter in low and somebody was throwing back 55 centimeters Cam. at the end. Cam, yeah. Hunter and Cam. <laughs> yeah, that cost them a little bit, too. Yeah. I don't think they won that. Did you say throwing back 50 centimeter Col- fish? Calling 50 centimeter fish. Yeah. They, I think they called like a 55 with two minutes to go. Yeah. I don't remember many 60s being caught here <laughs> lately, do you? Oh, back back then, it was taking 450 or 60 or 70 centimeters to win. As to where these last couple years, it's taken right around 400. We won with 429 this year. Well, and your last which, session in the Rumble, you caught a, was it a 64? A 64 and a 69. And it's like we all wanted to throw a party. And your like, That's the biggest fish I've seen in a while. Yeah. yeah. I think the 69 might be the biggest turned in on the Rumble. And Jimmy caught what? 64. 64. Yeah. yeah. That was the year before, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's a big fish. And so they used to throw 50 centimeters. I can't even imagine. The, the average used to be about 50 centimeters. Wow. Now it's about 40. Is that just is that just management? I mean, is that just how it's being managed? Different? Uh, from when I started to now... Is the same management, so I, okay. I, it's not man. It's not the management I think personnel. It's just Maybe a, just the fish they decide to throw in. They threw in a yeah. lot of big ones this year. 
I mean, to catch a 64 and a 69 on the same B, that's... They get hammered pretty hard, too. So. Yeah, they get their teeth kicked in there. So let's talk about the actual championship. Okay. Is there going to be any changes to the venues or... Uh, there will be some beat changes. They'll definitely be a little longer. Two-hour sessions. Um, ah, two-hour sessions. Okay. I like yeah. that. It'll be shorter time between sessions, but you'll get 30 extra minutes to put up a couple more fish. It'll be a random group draw. Or? I'm still trying to decide. I, I don't know if I want to do – I don't know if I want to have fly comps run a draw with blank names and pair y'all up like whoever finishes first in group – put that person in group A as the first angler, whoever finishes second, first angler in group B, third, first angler in group C, fourth, kind of flight y'all. I don't know if I want to do it that way. Or if I want to just let fly comps decide y'all's fate. I vote option A. Option A sounds pretty good. Seed it, you know? Yeah. Seed it. It'd be a lot better than my group draw this week, I can promise yeah. you. We're it, actually doing that with the Southeastern Fly Fishing yeah. League for the cup races. Mm-hmm. We're seeding those. Okay, I and, think and, I remember y'all talking about yeah. that at the last event here. Yeah, and I think uh, Ken Crane may be able to do that with fly comps. I'm not sure, like. You put in the seating or something. I got you. Maybe. I don't know. But uh, I think that would be the most fair because. I would probably do mine a little differently. Mm -hmm. Like I would go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So one to four down and then five to eight up. I don't like that. Does that make sense? So you don't have like have all the fourth, every fourth angler is going to be on the bottom. I got you. So it'll be like, it'll be staggered yeah. through there. Yeah. Okay. And then you're you're also doing dinner too, right? Or lunch? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to do dinner on Saturday. Nice. For everyone. That'd be sweet. You said you're going to extend the beats? You're going to do, there's only so going to be three, there'll be three beats in each section? Six. Six. Yeah. Okay. Four groups of six. Are right. you going to try to – are you going to eliminate some and – I'm going to weed through a couple of them. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you want to take out, like, some of the better beats? I know, like, the conflicts is – Some of the well, bad ones, I tell too. you what's hard to do is say which beats are better. Very true. Because, I mean, beat six on the trophy section has been putting up, like, two or three fish a session. And who had it today? Mark Greer caught six out of it. Yeah. So it's it's hard to say what's – What's better and what's what's worse? Maybe what's worse is easier, right? I mean, some of them have been consistently low. I think. Yeah, beat one's been tough. What I would probably do on beat one is is make it longer because it is a good beat, and in May it could be a really really good beat. You're talking about trophy water, right? Yeah, yeah. The general water, like one and two, has probably been some of the worst beats. Two and three. One, one, two, and three is coming out. 100%. <laughs> I'm okay with that. But Eli might have, no, Eli didn't win a session on B3. I think he took a two on that. He won, he had B1. This morning. Won the, when he won the tournament, mm-hmm. like the first one I think he won, yeah. he had beat one Yeah. on the general. I remember that. Yeah. He caught a bunch out of B3 today. Yeah, you got 10 out of beat three on the general water. And surprising. Seven out of beat three on the trophy water. All right. So, upcoming national championship. Actually, before we get to that, what is the dates for the <laughs> Cherokee Series championship? Because I don't, I don't May think I 9th know that. May 10th. Is that Mother's Day? I believe so. You know that the Team USA, the, the youth clinic, North Carolina clinics that same weekend. Yeah. Okay. I got no choice. Gotcha. All the all the events going on in April, and then I'm leaving towards the end of April. Coming back, they said it needs to be hosted. So that's. that's I guess it. I'll be dropping the kid off and Nana Hale and coming up here. At least then. he won't be breaking no score trays then. <laughs> <laughs> he is rough on the score trays. Of course I am too. I dropped a uh, 
In the regional, I dropped one in the lake. Like, it went straight to the bottom. Oh, my. PVC does not float at all. <laughs> I was like, okay. All right, so upcoming national championships. Um, what are you doing to get ready, if anything? Are you familiar with the venues? I know, I know the Roaring Fork, Frying Pan. I'm, that's the only two I know. I don't know the Crystal River, and I don't know what – I don't even know the name of the lake we're fishing. There's only one lake, right? Yeah. Okay. The rivers are probably going to be flooded with the ice out or ice off or whatever you call it. Runoff. Or That's right. Yeah, runoff. Snow melt. Runoff. Yeah. Snow melt, runoff, all that. Because, yeah. Well, no, this is before. This will be before the runoff. Should be, right? When's it? Is it they told it, us to be prepared for Middle it. of April, right? Late April. Late April. Okay. Yeah, it was like April 29th to May 2nd or something. <clears throat> So I I got it out west in Wyoming in my summers in college. The first year I went out there, we got out of school in like first of May. I go out there, I go to the river I'm guiding on, and it's 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 runoff, and I'm like, how in the world do you fish this? I yeah. mean, it's like rolling like class five rapid the whole thing. Like there's not even a place for a fish to hold. And I was like, how am I supposed to fish this? You know? And he's like, don't worry, in like a month. Perfect. I was like, all right. Yeah. That's good practice for Cherokee. <laughs> Class five rapids. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I guess I could answer the part about getting prepared for it. So one of our teammates went up this last week or in the last week or so and he went up and pre fished all the not all. I think he pre fished three of the venues on the practice water there and he just sent his, his intel and where the fish were holding and Sweet. what flies. And thanks, Lance. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Cody. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Thanks to Cody. <clears throat> so are you doing anything specially or specific for this? Just, just tying the flies that he sent. Okay. Or trying to. Sometimes it's hard to match a, pic- a picture. Yeah. Especially, on, I don't know why on Facebook when you send a picture, it's, Fuzzy, but it's it's all bureaucracy, man. Yeah, yeah his, his, his fly pictures are a little tough everything. to see. They all look like Griffith snaps. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's doing that on purpose. He really doesn't want you to know what flies he's using. <laughs> Here, here's the flies I'm using. I'm sharing information. <laughs> it's like all blurry. <clears throat> all right, so what implications does this national championship have, really? Implications? Yeah, I mean, like, who does this, this is this going to decide who's going to be pretty much on the world team? Are some of the uh, some guys going to be? I think. Do they have to do well? I guess to keep their place, or I think the team knows who's going to worlds. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's just the way I feel. So, I'm going to say. It doesn't affect who's going. It may or may not. I don't know. I got you. I meddled in two of them and only got to go to one of them. So finished top five in two consecutive cycles. Only got picked for one of them. So, so who's the top five anglers in the United States right now? Right now, uh, Pat, Devin, me. Pat, Devin, me. I don't know that. I had it pulled up on my. We're not on there, Wilson. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't thinking so. I wasn't thinking so. Um, I want to say Cody Bergdorf. I think Josh Graffin jumped up to fourth. And then Cody Bergdorf and. Um, Jack Arnott are fifth and sixth. And after that, I believe Lance is seventh. But there's only a couple guys that aren't on Team USA that are in the top 15 right now. Hmm. So talking about the team and anglers being good and all that sort of thing, 
here in the South, I mean, I remember Mason talking about when they were going to Worlds, they were competing like they competed in like something like sixty tournaments in a year. Maybe it was way more than that. It, I remember it was a big number of tournaments in one year mm-hmm. for, when he was in the youth team. And I know that – so we have a lot of competitions here in the South. I mean, constantly, right? Yeah. Like, you can't even get a free weekend, Harley. Yeah. And I know up in PA, they're doing a lot of competitions up there. Yeah. Out West, you don't see any – you don't see any leagues. You don't see any comps. Yeah, I think – I don't know if it's frowned upon or if people just get ill about competing because they're, they're uh, purists or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. I just wonder how uh, – for me, I, how do they stay sharp out there? Because I mean, I think the number of competitions here makes makes the angles around here better. You know, it makes yeah. people better because you're competing, sure. you're forcing yourself to get better. Where maybe out there you're not competing as much. I kind of wonder how they, you know. So I don't I don't know what they do to stay sharp for competitions. <clears throat> I know some of the guys, uh, Josh Graffham, Cody Bergdorf, and a handful of others in the Denver area. They run a lake series. I forget what they call it, but it's a one-day lake tournament. It's a, they kind of run it like a bracket thing. So you draw your you draw your boat and whoever you fish against. You're fishing against only the person in your boat, and you get like an hour and a half to control the boat each angler does. And at the end of that, whoever loses, whoever catches or has a low score is out. And they do like a hundred dollar buy ins. That seems to go against everything I've learned about lake fishing. It's kind of risky, you know. You're, well, it's like, you know, I've always been taught when you're in a boat, it's always like, all right, me and you are finishing one and two, yeah. All right? Yeah. And, and now this is like, you're out. Like I want you out, right? Yeah. I'm trying to beat you. Don't look at my fly box. Yeah, it's right? it's a risky way to compete, but I think it's one of the only ways that they can get eight or ten people out there to compete. Yeah. Well, that's neat. So uh, tell us a little bit about how somebody can come fish you and your guide business and, like, what's going on in your world. I, I even heard somebody mention that you had mentioned about having a tri fly only tournament. Yeah. That sounds yeah, awesome. I thought, about, I thought about doing a dry fly only in December. Or in December, I'm sorry. <laughs> in uh, July. That'd be awesome. A little hemisphere change there. Do you think there's probably like four guys around here that know how to fish dry flies, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, you don't give a guy an egg, it's, and I don't know if he knows even what to do. You know what I'm saying? I feel like that's a stab at me. I'm not looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> you feel like I was looking at you? I'm sorry. Right there. <clears throat> uh, There's there's a handful of people that know know how to fish drives. Yeah, I was I, I would probably fish it as well. Yeah. So I don't know if, if that'll turn people away or not. It's no fun to have a great a fun like a different tournament like that and not be able to fish in it, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, I was joking just because I mean The guy I stayed with in Tasmania, he <clears> said he's coming up early July, I believe. Maybe late June. But he'll be available for like a he has like a free week or two in July. And he said he he said if he can get down he'll fish it. Really good dry fly angler. But we'd talked about doing like a, a ten X tournament or a nine X or whatever. Yeah. I think that'd be pretty I fun. Th- I th- honestly I think something like that would be a great a great way to make people uh, versatile out there. Change their style. A little, right? Well, Change their sure. comfort level. For sure. Yeah. You got to fix fish 9X on a trophy. That's going to be kind of tough. <laughs> <laughs> I fish 8X out there occasionally. I fish 8X a lot on the general water. Mostly 6.5 and, and 7 on the trophy, though. So your what's your website? Uh, www.flyfishcherokeenc.com Yeah, and you, and you teach all your techniques and... Yeah. Not afraid at all to show everyone no. just exactly how to fish these awesome no, waters. If, right? if anybody comes to fish, as they get one hundred percent of the show there. Yeah. All right, man. Well, 
I'm glad you come on uh, come on the show here. Appreciate you coming out and doing this. Really, yeah. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Yeah, I appreciate the invite. <clears throat> Thank you. It's a lot of fun. I think uh, I think you've done a lot for competition fishing and and raising the level of uh, of the anglers in this area. I mean, you look at my fly box. A lot of your flies are in there. <laughs> <laughs> Peyton took it. Peyton took his fly box, which looks like mirrors my fly box at the Pennsylvania comp. He was showing Bradley, and Bradley goes, "Huh, this looks like my fly box." <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, man, thanks for coming on. <laughs>